<laughs> you guys do look good. Maddie took my um, my thoughts right out of off the bat. You guys look great. I'm excited to be here. I feel very honored to speak to you today. And yes, if you have seen me before, I usually am on like one of these mics, not this mic. So this is a little different for me, but um, I am excited. I am married to Rich, if you're new here. The only British person to walk into Morgan City or live in Morgan City for a number of years. Wave, wave. We, um, yeah, stand up. We get to sing songs to Jesus and we love it. We have two kids, Cash, who is seven, and Ember, who is one, Ember with an E. And uh, if you've seen her, you've seen Richard. And if you've seen Richard, you've seen her. So they look exactly the same. <laughs> So, um, yeah, the Lord brought us back here about four years ago this week, which is so interesting. Um, after living in Dallas for 10 years where we met and briefly living in the UK. So God does funny things, doesn't he? <laughs> so today we're going to continue our series through Matthew 5 through 7. And if you've been here, this has been really good, right? You enjoyed it? If you have not been here, this is your first time you're hearing this, well, I encourage you to go back and listen because it's important that we are going on a journey together, right? Really, really good. So we are going to be talking about something that I am very, very passionate about. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. I'm excited, okay? And that is being, emphasis on the word being, salt and light. So I'm going to touch on a few things just to recap, and I'm sticking to my notes because I have 21 pages of notes to get through. No joke, but don't worry. Oh, wait, set my timer. I'm on it. We're going to honor the time. So 21, I know, I know. It's okay. So we're going to create or we're going to place some framework as before we go into this. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, and thank you for what you're doing here. It's good. <laughs> would you speak to our hearts? And I ask that we would leave changed today. I want to leave changed after hearing your word and being in your presence. So would you change the way we think? You are better than we think, so change the way we think. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. It's super important to study scripture in context, right? If you were here Wednesday, Richard said this, which I loved his message. It was awesome. Proud of you. So it's important to read the whole letter, right? Not just like picking out random verses here and there and then building this whole thing on them, right? This is why we're going on a journey. So I used to read Matthew 5 through 7 with all the red letters that Jesus said, right? as very separate thoughts and a lot of heavy topics. Like, whew, that's rough. Like, I, and almost in, a, in the sense of like, I don't know if I really wanna read through this because it makes me feel a little uncomfortable, right? Things like anxiousness, divorce, greed, like these big heavy topics. So if you're like me and you have struggled with, I don't know, perfectionism or striving you would read these and think like, wow, it, would, it might even bring up some shame. Like, man, I've been through this. This is, I don't know if I like hearing people speak to me on these topics, right? But here's some good news before we start. Through Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus is showing us that it's through him. This is the only way to walk this thing out, right? Only through him. He is pointing us to the good news. Whew. Everyone go, whoo. Whoo. No pressure, right? It takes the pressure off because it's not about us doing something. He already did it, and he's doing it through these scriptures, okay? That's good. We can't work enough. We can't try our hardest. We can't pray enough. We can't fast enough. We can't do this enough to do these things that he's saying. He's, he's taken the law, and he's leveled it up, right? Yeah. Level up, friends. He's like, guess what? You can only do it through me. That is good. It's only through Jesus that any of these things can be understood, really. So when we start from that place, reading through these verses look vastly different, right? So Jesus is pointing us and directing us to what? The good news that we as followers of Christ are to carry and spread throughout the earth. Religion and legalistic thinking will produce the opposite of good news. What's that? Bad news, right? Well, why is it bad? Well, too bad for you. You don't measure up, friend. 
too bad for you. You don't pray enough and you don't read your Bible enough. So therefore, you don't count and you will never walk in this. Am I right? Some of us have heard these thoughts in our head, right? So what does bad news produce? Fake news. Hashtag fake news. You ever heard of that? <laughs> fake news. <laughs> Why is this fake? Well, false. It, it creates false ideas of the character and nature of Jesus. Fake. It's fake. So if we do not know the message of the good news, we cannot walk in the thing that Jesus is speaking about in these scriptures. So I've been walking with the Lord since 2008, right? I have three Bible school degrees, three. Why am I telling you this? Not because I'm important, but because I still have trouble walking in this, right? This is not easy. I'm not saying these things because, oh, it's so easy to do. No, we're all walking this thing out, right? We get distracted just being transparent up here, okay? So before we jump into this verse, these verses, look to your neighborino, huh? look to your neighborino and say this out loud. I want to hear it. No striving, no striving, no works, no earning. All right, here we go. Yay, freedom. All right. Whew, y'all getting me excited. All right. Sermon on the Mount. So I know this is repetitive and I'm, I'm kind of speaking fast because like 21 pages. Okay. So I know this is repetitive. Um, and if you've been on this journey, we're going to recap, but it's going to be a fun recap. Okay. And I brought prizes. I did. I brought prizes. So only two though. Don't get too excited. <laughs> two prizes. All I had in my house. Two of them. Okay. Right. Here they are. So I am looking for a specific word. First question, who was Jesus speaking to on the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount? Okay, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. That's true. <laughs> that's not the word I'm looking for. It's a specific word, and it starts with an M. Oh, gosh, you were letting me down, right? Come on, Rich. Give, it, give me the word. Or Kayla. Kayla. What was it? Oh, guys. What is it? Yeah, kind of. Well, no, that's okay. All right, guys. Here, someone take a chocolate. <laughs> it's the marginalized. He was speaking to the marginalized. Yes, and the disciples, but the marginalized. We talked about this. Oh, man, no chocolate for you. <laughs> Jeez. All right. The marginalized people who were treated as what? Insignificant. People who don't have fancy titles, people who don't have qualifications. So why am I saying this? This kills the thought process that you have to have all your ducks in a row, right? You have to work for a church, do all these great things to be used by God. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So it also says, yes, he was, to speak, he was speaking to his disciples or his followers. So Kayla and Jamie took us through the Beatitudes and Kayla spoke on the word blessed which, don't say the word, Kayla. If you know the word, you get a chocolate. What was the word? Oh, oh, nope, Millie's got it. This is like gold. Those little chocolates are gold in my house. No, it's a, it's a little kinder chocolate. It's a miracle that I even have these two, right? Look, you can have it. Look, you get it. You get the chocolate. You get the chocolate. You earn the chocolate, girl. All right. <laughs> All right, I'm now out of chocolate. No more. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> so thanks for playing. So Jamie then took us through the scriptures, right, to show us how Jesus, what, lived the Beatitudes, which was very, very good. So continuing, Matthew 13 through 16. It's important to note that now Jesus is shifting gears a little bit, right? He's spoken to the crowds about the upside down kingdom, but now he's speaking to his disciples or followers or people who want to be a part of this kingdom. And he speaks directly to what? Their identity, okay? So again, I'm gonna say this, if you don't know your identity in Christ and our place in the kingdom, we can do very little, right? Because everything stems from identity. So hear me, hear me loud and clear when I say this. This is not 
a do more to be more message, okay? This is a you already are this, so let's start walking in it message, okay? I'm giving you more framework. So now let's open our Bibles. We're going to have it on the screen to Matthew 5, 13 through 16, and I'm reading out of the NLT. There it is. Okay. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So let's break this into two parts. First part, you are the salt of the earth. Pause. Why would Jesus compare his followers to salt? Interesting. Why wouldn't he say, you are the flowers of the earth, or you are the freshly baked bread, I baked bread this morning, of the earth? He says salt. <laughs> Let's explore this a little bit further. So salt was used for a number of things in Jesus' times. The first and foremost, the most obvious, I should say, is what to season. I'm getting to that, preserve. We're seasoning, okay? <laughs> hang on, hang on, Aaron. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> to season things. So, being from South Louisiana, there is one thing I am very, very confident in, and that is we know how to what? Season things. In fact, if you are from the real South, I mean, like, laugh yet in both, no offense, Kayla. If you are below South, you know, Lafayette, you know how to season things, right? Our food is famous. Our seasonings are famous, okay? You know this if you have ever traveled to, obviously, another state or another country, okay? I have been all over. And every country I go to, there is always a little section in the store that says Cajun seasoning or Cajun rice or some form of Cajun something. And I remember, I remember living in England and going to the store and seeing this. And it was, they had Cajun stuff everywhere, right? And I'm thinking, that's cute. Like, <laughs> that's cute. Sha, sha bay. That's cute. But it's not it, you know? <laughs> but there's a reason it's famous, right? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I like it. Why is this important? Why is salt important? Why is seasoning important, right? It what? It enhances the flavor, makes it taste better. So what's interesting about salt is the idea that in most recipes, especially with baking, a little salt goes a long way, right? Every recipe, I, there's very few recipes that do not have salt, okay? A little salt dissolves and it seasons and flavors the whole thing, okay? So at this point, I would imagine that the disciples are very few, right? It's not like Jesus is in this place where he has like 1.3 million TikTok followers and all these people following him. He's telling these few people, you are the salt of the earth, right? Can you imagine being there like, what? Like, we got like 12, like maybe like 15, I don't know. <laughs> But Jesus was telling them it only takes a few who carry the salt identity of the kingdom. They, they are to go out and to start flavoring the earth with the good news, okay? We all know this when Jesus later tells his followers, we're going to put on the screen, Mark 16, 15, go out into all the world and preach the what? The good news to everyone. The gospel of the kingdom is like salt, right? It's quick. It's penetrating. It's powerful, we are to walk in a kingdom identity that is powerful and that flavors everything it comes into contact with, okay? Salt was also used in an agricultural context. So in a biblical archaeology review that I was reading, I definitely had to look this up. I had no prior knowledge to this, but um, they were talking about that the salts in Jesus' time were a little different than what we're familiar with today. 
So there are rock salts, salts evaporated from the dead seawater, and salt pits. There are many examples of salts being used as like compounds and fertilizer, okay? The writer says that the value of salt in small quantities appears to have been known in ancient time. Many sources record its power to improving herbage or vegetation in pastures. Interesting. Salt was also used as, Aaron said it, a preservative. We've probably heard this before, right? It's important for making things last longer, okay? They did not have fancy refrigerators like we see today with the screens and the pictures and all the things that you can see inside your fridge. Super cool, did not have it. So they had to have a way to make their food and their things last so they don't spoil, right? Salt was also costly and had value. It was added to grain offerings. We see this, I think I have the scripture for this, in Leviticus 2.13, season all of your grain offerings with salt to remind you of God's eternal covenant. Never forget to add salt to your grain offerings. So salt represented purity, preservation, and expense. Salt was also used for wounds right? We know that even today. Salt prevents infection and harmful bacteria. So there's probably more examples, but all this to say that salt was what? It was needed by the people, and everyone was familiar with it in more ways than one. So Jesus was saying, you are the thing that the world needs, okay? Romans 8:19. For, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What if we looked at or understood the same exact scripture, the first one that we read, right? The one with salt, like this. You are the salt of the earth. The seasoning, the fertilizer, and the preservative. You came with a cost. And it's Jesus' sacrifice that has restored your purity and your identity. So be salt to the earth so that this kingdom infiltrates every part of society and every part of the earth to restore it to its original identity and original design. Like salt, you, you are to add flavor to all things, all things in society, in all things that God has created. That changes that just a little bit, right? When you have more of an understanding of why would he be saying salt, okay? So there are a lot of things and a lot of people on this earth that we know that do not know who they are and that God has created them, that God has loved them. They have no clue, right? There are a lot of good things in society that don't necessarily have a Christian bumper sticker on them. We know this, right? It's very, 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 very important that we understand this, okay? God has created all things, and he is calling all things back to himself, right? All things. I cannot stress that word enough. All things, not just Christian things. All things, okay? Whew, I feel the Holy Spirit. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. I am so passionate about this. All things. Christians, okay, I'm not talking about anyone in here particularly. I'm talking about like all Christians, me, everyone, okay, tend to gravitate towards what? Christian things. That's true, right? That's not a bad thing. We know this. Why? Well, preference, okay? Maybe fear of, what people think, like other Christians? You ever wanted to not post something because you're worried what they might think about you? Mm, she might be backsliding. Mm. Or maybe fear of the world. Can't do that, fear of the world. Mm. It's true, these, these sound silly, but it's true. And we see it all the time, right? I'm gonna say this, and I hope you see my heart in this, but I really feel like some, a lot of times, a lot of times that we try, like all Christians, the big C, capital church, right, to maintain like a Christian social club. And it's like, you get saved, say the sinner's prayer, or we can't do life with you, right? Like I can pray for you, I'll pray for you. But I'm not gonna be involved in your day-to-day -day life because we're not, we're not the same, right? 
It's true. true. Right? I'm guilty of it myself. And I'm very tired of it. So here are some things, because I love practical examples. I love a good example. So I wrote a list of examples for us. Here are some things that we, as followers of Christ, can add flavor to in our city and our society, okay? You ready? Buckle up. Let's go. <laughs> charities. Woo. There's lots of charities out there. You can Google. They'll come with lists of them, right? Charities are good. They're good things. Even if a Christian didn't start it, it's a good thing. Why? Because it helps people, right? Homeless shelters, great thing. A lot of us have served in that or are a part of that, right? This is a new one. Adoption agencies, huge, huge. This is a huge thing on my heart. I saw, a few, me and Millie were talking about this actually a few weeks ago at the homestead in Alabama, if you know it or don't know it. They had a couple in their church that had the desire to adopt, right? So what do they do? They bring them up in front of the church. We're going to pray for you. And we really feel like we're going to raise the money so that you can adopt a child. Do you know how much it costs to adopt a child in America? Oh, 20 plus grand. I guarantee you. It's crazy. How much did they raise? $48,000 that night for this couple. Isn't that incredible? Like, I'm not saying everybody has to go out and adopt a kid, but man, this is something we've got to... At least we can help. At least we can do something about it, you know? What about caring for the elderly in the nursing homes? The ones that people just, oh, they're just sick. They're just going to stay there until the end, you know? They need care, right? And our church actually cares for the elderly very well. Food pantries, the purple lemon, awesome, 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 awesome. Salt and light in our city, right? And so many of you serve there. What about loving your neighbors? Mm -hmm. Even the ones who don't cut their grass. That's me and Richard. Well, it was me and Richard. We got someone to cut our grass now. So Whew. can't be good at everything, right, friends? Whew. Hey, hey, we're busy. I'm too busy. OK. <laughs> All right, all right, all right, simmer down, simmer down. A few more. What about events in our community? Ooh, what is our city known for every single year? Hey, Shrimp and Petroleum Festival, right? Okay, I know some of you are internally and externally rolling your eyes right now. All right, and I'm not just saying this because my dad is the current Shrimp and Petroleum Festival king, which I'm very proud of, okay? What can we do to support these things in our society? Well, why would we support this? Well, because people care about it, right? Our city cares about it. The families care about it. And it represents something that is important, which is what? The petroleum industry and the shrimping industry. That families and generations, have, it has provided for families. It's good, right? Why would we not show up and offer to do something? Well, I don't want to be a part of that. It's too hot well, bay. Why don't you ask, maybe when it's over, hey, can our church come and pick up all the trash in the park for you? Just because we want to serve you. Why can't we do something to support that, right? All right, I'm almost done, but I really love this list, so I'm, I'm finishing it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, what about, okay, stay-at-home moms? I'm kind of a stay-at-home, mm, kind of part-time stay-at-home mom, but I know in that season you can maybe feel like you've got a lot on your plate, you know? Sometimes maybe even feeling a little discouraged, like, you know, I'm in this place, I'm kind of just changing diapers, doing the thing day in, day out. Well, what if you started a stay-at-home mom group? And you guys met up once a month and you did life together and you made breakfast and you, you know, we did this in, at my church in Dallas. Um, a girl saw the need. We had lots of young families. And so we would get together at the actual church because we had the room with all the toys. And we had like, I swear, like 30 kids because all of us had at least like two or three kids. And it was crazy. Kids running everywhere, you know, but we would meet and just, hey, how's your life? Like, how's your marriage? What's going on? Let's talk. Let's hang out. And eventually, it turned into not just church moms. It was all kind of moms. 
and they would say, hey, will you pray for my marriage? And then eventually they started coming to church, which was really cool. It was super fruitful. So that's just a little encouragement for moms who feel like a little lost in this season, you know. Also, um, art and music, local artists, local artists, lo local musicians, gigs. <gasps> but they don't sing in the church. Oh. <laughs> don't go there. Don't go there. No, these are good things, right? They're good. They're displaying the beauty that they were created to display, whether they know it or not, okay? Buy some art. Support someone. Hang it in your house. Jeez, lighten up. Okay, last one, last one. And this one, when I was typing this list out, I gotta be honest, I really felt the Holy Spirit like convict me, A, and also like really highlight this to me. Supporting the educators in our city. This is huge. This is huge. Okay, so Gidget, and I'm glad she showed up today because she almost did it. Uh, Gidget's a great example of this, and I know other people teach, and but I just know Gidget personally, but Gidget's out there doing the thing every single day, right? And dealing with a lot of drama. I can't even imagine. <laughs> and it's hard, right? And I know everyone, including myself, everyone has something to say about the education system. It's terrible. People aren't passionate anymore, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? If I was struggling every day going to a job, I probably wouldn't feel very passionate about it either, okay? No support from families, no support from parents. They're struggling, right? Is that a fair thing to say? They need support. How can we support the teachers in our city? Well, you can ask them, hey, can I pray for you? That's a, that's a start, right? Can I show up and serve at some school event? Do you need help? Or what about this? Hey, um, can we, we decided to get together, 10 of us, and we're going to get some money together, and we're going to cater food for you on a Friday, and I'm going to write you a card, and it's going to say, what you do matters, right? What you do educating our children changes the world, right? Because educators, what? They train the leaders of tomorrow. How else are they going to get educated, right? <laughs> this is huge, guys, and I, I can continue with the list and the list, but it's a lot of you already do this, and I want to recognize that because it's important. A lot of you serve in our community, and you do it very faithfully. And I think the Lord wants to honor you too. It's beautiful, especially walking in the purple lemon and seeing every single week people giving of their time and serving. And, and that's really important. And I think our church does that really well. So look to your neighbor and say, you are salt. Be salty. Well... <laughs> Maybe some of you are thinking, this sounds great, right? This all sounds great. It sounds positive. I feel pumped up. But you're also thinking, I'm not feeling that salty. I'm feeling the other kind of salty, right? <laughs> I'm aggravated at my workplace. I'm struggling with life. I'm disappointed with where the Lord has me. Struggle with my spouse. Struggling, okay? <laughs> and I get that, right? We all get that. We've all been there in certain seasons of our life, okay? So I wanna, I'm gonna say this one more time. This isn't a do more message to be something, remember? This is you are salt, so be salty. So we're not doing things in the sense of earning something. Work, 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 earn, earn, right? But I understand that what I'm asking you to do requires you to actually do something, okay? But here's the difference between the two. You will naturally start walking in this when your awareness shifts, right? Into who God has made you to be and the calling to which he is calling you, okay? So it changes, it shifts. Here's two examples. I like this one. Have you ever been in love? Mm. Uh, Y'all should all be going like this, especially if you're married. Like this, like this. Shake, shake your head. Okay. I have learned that this is not shaking your head, per my husband. This is shaking your head, but I'm going to say shaking your head because I like that. Yes, right? 
Yeah, there we go. Hey, Joe. Joe still is. Richard, you, you still are, right? <laughs> All right. If you are not saying yes, then we have a great marriage counseling resource for you. So see me after. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story, and I hope you enjoy it. Richard and I started dating back in 2013. Ah, I know. And we would go on these things called date day Saturdays. It was really cute because, you know, after school, you go to school all day, and then he worked because he was an scho international scholarship student. So we would look forward to these Saturday date days every week. And Richard is very, 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 very good at planning these things. He's very intentional, and he's very, very romantic, okay? I love you. You are. And he's very thoughtful in, like, his gift-giving and his planning. I'll give you an example. So on our third date, he gave me a necklace with a picture of Pemberley, which is from the movie and the book Pride and Prejudice, my favorite book of all time, favorite movie. And he gave it to me knowing that eight months later, he would take me to that exact place on the picture and ask me to marry him. <laughs> okay, take a note if you're single. That is good, okay? And if you're married, take a note because you need to step your game up. Okay. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Richard. All right, all right, all right. Simmer down, simmer down. <laughs> okay. But the point is that he was great at planning these dates. So we looked forward to him, okay? So Saturday rolls around, this one particular Saturday, and I would always drive because he didn't have a license in America. So I'm driving, he's planning, and he puts the address in my GPS, and I'm driving. <laughs> I love you. Like, <laughs> And I'm driving, and I'm driving, I'm like, whew, it's been 45 minutes. And we lived in the Dallas Metroplex, and if you've been there, you know it's big. You can drive all over, right? Hour later, hour and 30 minutes later, I'm driving to a lunch date. I'm like, wow, this is getting kind of far. And one thing Richard is not very good at, <laughs> see, they know, they already know what I'm going to say. He is directionally challenged, okay? Wait, disclaimer, not in the spirit. He's great in the spirit, but in the natural. It's almost like God was like, you can't be good at both. You have to either be good in the spirit or good in the natural. And he's good in the spirit, okay? So I drove for two hours to show up at a lunch date. It was beautiful. I loved it. You know, we had this fancy French chef, which I have no idea why he moved on the other side of Fort Worth. But he started this restaurant, and the food was wonderful, and we were so in love I could have driven to Oklahoma. I didn't care. Like, I just wanted to be with him, right? Okay, keep tracking with me. So if you know, or if you have children, you know this is true, right? You wake up early on Saturdays. Okay, let me just say this. The person you are before you have kids and the person you are after, after kids are like two different night and day people, right? You do things you don't want to do, right, all the time. <laughs> You, uh, your whole weekend is not a weekend, right? You literally, like, show up at every game, show up at every dance recital, pay for everything. You sacrifice constantly. But you do it because why? You what? You love them. I hope you love your kids, right? This week alone, I'll give you another example. I love examples, if you haven't tell, if you can't tell. I received this letter um, from my child's teacher, and the first grade field trip is coming up. Woo, first one, he is pumped. He's like, field trip. And the, the paper's like, we need parent volunteers. So, of course, I'm going to be there, right? I would love to be there. Read the small print underneath that, and it says that you have to be safeguard certified. I'm like, all right, well, background check. Cool, safety, awesome. Go on the website, filling out my information. I realized very quickly that being safeguard certified means it's a, uh, you have to go through a 98 page course, <laughs> online course, and be tested. And if you don't pass the test, you don't go on a field trip to the zoo, okay? So I'm like, what in the world? So I, what do I do? I stop working on this, and I spend an hour and a half becoming safeguard certified for my kid. 
and I passed the test. 10 out of 10. Yay! So if you ever need a, um, you know, a chaperone, let me know. Um, I am background checked and all. But these are silly and, like, funny. But my point being is love produces action, right? We naturally do these things out of a place of love. So when we're close to Jesus, we love him, right? We start doing some pretty crazy things we wouldn't normally do just naturally. Think of when you first got saved and you started posting on social media. Facebook, you ever have time hop when it pops up from 10 years ago and you're like, whoo, <laughs> I re- <laughs> where that guy went? <laughs> no, I, I read these all the time and realize like I had zero chill and I did not care what people thought about what I felt about the Lord. I was out there for everyone to see, you know, because you're so in love, okay? <laughs> when you deeply love the Lord, it's a lot easier to go into your workplaces and to your family members, right? And be salt. We love because what? He first loved us. We start walking naturally in our salt identity from the place of intimacy with the Lord. And it becomes an overflow, and it overflows into every area of our life. Does that make sense? Okay, so whatever area of influence that God has given you or placed you, be salty there, okay? It doesn't matter if it's the dream job you've always wanted or your dream coworkers or hanging out with your dream family members. Guess what? We all got crazy family members. We don't pick our family, okay? <laughs> But be salt where God has called you, okay? Our identity in the kingdom should shake up the places we go and the people that we are with naturally, okay? So this week, we're going to do a challenge. Homework, fun homework. Fun homework, yes. Ask the Lord what this looks like for you, right? Think of the gifts that you have that are God-given gifts, How can you use them? How can you walk this thing out very practically, okay? It's not meant to be hard. It's just meant to shift our minds a little bit. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Or what? It's purpose, our purpose, okay? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. I want my purpose, our purpose, to align with who Jesus already says that we are, okay? And it's time that we intentionally start living this thing out, right? You guys okay? All right. We alive? We're well? We're good? Moving on, second part. This one, I've got to talk. Girl, I am too, if you only knew. I love this. Okay, let's read this second part. Don't worry, this part's not as long as the first, so. All right, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. So, John 8, 12, we have that up. Thank you, Miss Vicki, you're awesome. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you, ha- you won't have to walk in darkness because you will already have the light that leads to life. We carry the light because we are in Christ. We are the light of Christ to the world. So when you walk in a room full of darkness, guess what? The light has come and darkness has to flee. This is our reality as sons and daughters walking in this kingdom, okay? Darkness stays until light comes, right? I mean, this isn't super hard to understand. Darkness is the absence of light, okay? So Jesus in these verses is not necessarily talking about exposing darkness, okay? Sometimes that is the byproduct, though. It's interesting that Jesus uses a city when speaking about light because a city speaks of community, shelter, 
care, people, refuge. At nighttime, a city on a hill is like a lamp, right? It shines in the midst of darkness, and it's like a beacon of hope. It draws people to it for refuge. It cannot be kept hidden or a secret. So the idea of a city on a hill or a community of people and a lamp like an individual that gives light to a room speaks of being placed somewhere very strategic. Cities on hills don't move, right? Imagine a whole entire city on a hill going, I don't like this hill. We're going to get up. We're going to move to another one. It doesn't. It's placed there, right? He says you placed The lamp is placed on a stand in a very specific spot. He doesn't walk the lamp around the house in every room. It's placed there, and it gives light to everything, okay? He uses two examples that don't move, right? So I'll tell you a story. I have had the honor, really, and the privilege of um, leading two separate mission teams all over Asia to multiple countries in Asia, And um, we went to minister to marginalized, right? Um, You know, lady boys and prostitutes pulled out of the sex trade in Cambodia and um, people in poverty just with nothing. And it it changed my life. Like even retyping this, I was just like in CC's crying, like, wow. It was just such this beautiful time in my life that the Lord always brings me back to. We saw miracles literally miracles happening in China, which I won't go into because we're recording. But all that to say is um, we were able to work with this missionary, and, I mean, she was incredible. And what she does is she's from here, and the Lord called her to move to Thailand, and she just did it out of obedience, not really knowing what would start to open up. So eventually her ministry became ministering to refugees that have come from Burma, right? They've escaped war and poverty, and they've crossed the river and come into Thailand and lived in the mountains of Thailand. And she would, you know, look for these people and build these camps, as she calls them. So she had about 10 plus camps. And she would have contacts in Burma that were Christians, and she would say, I mean, they would tell these people, go through the river and find these camps. And this lady is going to come to you, and she's going to help you, okay? It was incredible. So what we did is we got a team together, went over there, and just helped her with very practical things, you know, um, stocking water and supplies and formula for babies because these mothers are so malnourished, they can't even feed their own children, right? So we traveled um, in the mountains, which was very scary, in some vans, and went to these camps just every single day and dropped these supplies off, right? And we would hang out with these people, and we couldn't speak the same language, obviously, just loved on them, played soccer, football, whatever, football with the kids. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) and she would do this every month, okay? So imagine 10 plus camps full of people every single month providing for them. That's a lot of people to care for, okay? And she would do it every single month, and the Lord would provide the funds. They would go up. She would have the team. She would have the people. Total, it's the miraculous, right? So she would eventually tell, you know, some of the camps, let's all meet at this one camp, and I'm going to bring these people to you, and they just want to come and love on you. So we would show up at this one camp, and we'd put this huge kids outreach on. It was awesome. Loved it. Got to play with the kids, do the skids, do the songs, do everything. But eventually we noticed that after doing this for two weeks, um, the people, when they would show up, they'd run up to the van and they would love on this lady because they just, they knew she was there to just love them and care for them, right? They weren't really like running for the supplies like you would think. They wanted to gather and hear about the Lord, right? Because when she first met these people, she wasn't gather them all up. Let's have a crusade and repent. Preach, preach, preach. She said, no, I'm going to, I just really want to come and like wash your feet and love you and serve you. No agenda. There's no agenda here. And they begin to just be drawn to Christ in her. And now they literally wait for her to show up so they can hear about the good news. Isn't that amazing? Right? One woman one remaining 
in the place that God has called her, being the hands and feet of Jesus, can have a lot of influence, right? When we care and we love others and we serve people, they see him, the light, and they are drawn to it. Like a city, the light of Christ shines in us and all who see it are attracted to it. So the place that the Lord has put you, right? You, think of where you are in your everyday life that you show up to. Shine, shine. Let the light shine in you so that all will see it, right? Because Jesus is very attractive to people. You were attracted to him and you didn't even know it, right? You always hear things. People who don't know the Lord will say, man, I don't know what it is about you. There's just something about you that's so different. It's the light of Christ in you, right? Don't hide who you are in your workplace or in your families anymore. Care for people. Serve people. Love people, right? If you feel like God has placed a prophetic gifting in you, well, then go prophesy where you are. Okay? You want to be a pastor? Go pastor the people that are around you. Okay? We don't need any more right now. We're good. We're good. I'm serious. We don't need another church in our city. We need societal transformation, right? We're beyond that. We've got enough churches. We've got enough leaders. We need you to be who you're called to be and change society, okay? I'm winding down, so just hang on for a few more minutes. So the... <laughs> I love this. <laughs> so there's a prophetic word, actually several prophetic words that were given about Morgan City, okay? So listen up. I, and I've been on the hunt for these words. I've been texting all kind of people. Do you remember this? Do you remember this from this church, this church? And no one wrote them down for some reason, but they exist, I promise. And um, so several different ministers have come over the years to our city and have strangely prophesied very similar things. And that, would, that is that God would use Morgan City as a lighthouse to the nation. Several people have prophesied this, okay? That's huge, right? So what is a lighthouse? It's something placed strategic, right? Somewhere, something that is placed somewhere strategic to aid and guide ships to or people to their destination, okay? So when I was searching for this word, a pastor that... Um, we were asking this word about, seeing if she remembered. She said, what's funny about this is two Sundays ago, the Lord spoke to her and said, I am not finished with Morgan City, and you need to begin to speak over the city. Two Sundays ago, this happened, okay? Kind of sounds like the Holy Spirit's saying something, right? Whoa. Do you think that this word can come to pass in our city? Do you? I think so, Right? Well, guess how this starts? You. Salt and light. You are salt and light. Societal transformation starts with you, okay? It starts with me. Bill Johnson said this, and I love this quote. It's a little long, so just, it's good, though. <clears throat> we cannot add flavor to a world that we are not a part of. Neither can we illuminate one room while we're in another. Our assignment by nature is to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, keep accountable, and to go to our light. And this is ecclesia. This is us. So those who are afraid of being defiled by the world have little faith in the power and the blood of Jesus that continually flows to keep us clean and the power of the Holy Spirit to guide, protect, and empower us to make a difference. This realization is the primary factor in our becoming transformational people. We, we represent the government of heaven every time we get together, even if it's at the coffee shop or to work. Two or three of us with Jesus among us are the majority in a world of influence. Now, let's use this influence well. That's a good quote, right? That pretty much says it all. So in the same way, 
Let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I'm ending with this. I was thinking about our church when I was writing this, and I kept feeling the overwhelming, you know, feeling that, like, this is us, and we can do this. Like, we can see our city changed. Why else are we here? To get together and sing? And, like, it's more than that, right? It's walking in the purpose that God has called us to walk in, and we will not be fulfilled until we are walking in that purpose. I guarantee you. Take it from someone who searched for years and years. What's my purpose? What? I'm just, I'm here, I'm in this church, and I'm this, and I'm doing that. I, but I'm not really walking in what Jesus has told me to walk in and who he said that I already am, right? It's like an awakening in your spirit and in your thought process to walk in this identity of salt and light. And it can start right here today, right now, when we walk right out those doors right there. Do you believe that? Do you want to do that? I want to do that. I'm ready to do it. I already have a list of things I'm like working on this week because it's so, it's burning inside of me, right? So I'm going to pray. And um, after I pray, I want to ask the ministry team if you guys want to come up. Uh, We are going to read our prayer declaration. I love the prayer declarations. I love reading them together. And then if you need prayer, Um, They'll be up here to pray for whatever you have going on, whatever you need. But I want to encourage you, let's do this. Ask the Lord what this looks like for you. And it looks different for everybody, and I understand that, okay? And I want to start hearing testimonies of this. We should be talking about this. Guess what God did in my city? Guess what God did in my workplace? Guess what God's doing in my school? Guess what God's doing here? Guess what God's doing there, right? So let's pray. (sighs) Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in our city. We say yes to the plans that you have for this house and for this city. And we declare that they will, will come to pass. I thank you for every person sitting in this room, and I ask that you would show them what this looks like in their life to walk this out. And I thank you that you're already proud of exactly who they are and exactly where they're at, that we don't have to strive, we don't have to earn this, we don't have to work for it, that Jesus, you have already done it, and we're just walking in the reality of this. Would you help us to love people in this city well, not because we have an agenda, but because you love them and we love you. Thank you, Lord. And I I felt to pray this over you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We love you, Jesus. This is all for you. It is for you. That's why we're here. It's for you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said,